When we look at the Nintendo Wii, we see one of the best selling consoles of all time. As of right now, the Wii is the sixth most sold console of all time, with 101 million units sold. Now, the Wii's lifespan was from 2006 7 to 2013 when it stopped production. This was a good eight year lifespan. The console war began all the way back in the 80s when Nintendo came out with the Nintendo Entertainment System. The NES sold a total of 61 million units as of right now. Sega was in competition with Nintendo at the time and came out with the Sega Genesis. As a response, Nintendo dropped the SNES, Super Nintendo Entertainment System, which as of right now sold a total of 49 million copies. Mind you, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System's whole spiel was to be the Super version of the Nintendo Entertainment System. But moving on, now it's the 90s and Nintendo was working on the N64. Nintendo tasked Sony to make an N64 with a disk drive, but later abandoned the project. Sony, not wanting all of their hard work to go to waste, used the project to create the PlayStation. To this day, the PlayStation stands as the fifth most sold console of all time at 102 million units sold. For contrast, the N64 to this day sold 32 million units. That means the PlayStation tripled the sales of the N64 and then some. But again, moving on. Next up is Nintendo versus Sony versus Microsoft. Now, Sony dropped the PlayStation 2, Nintendo, the GameCube, and Microsoft with the Xbox. The PS2, to this day, is the most sold console of all time with over 155 million units. Should we even mention the others? More relevant to the point that I'm about to make is another console war, including Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo. Like I said earlier, the Wii sold 101 million units. During this time, Microsoft dropped the 360 and Sony dropped the PS3. All three consoles did good, but none better than the Wii. The 360 sits right under the Nintendo Switch with 84 million units sold. The PS3, meanwhile, sits right above the Switch at 87 million units sold. Next up, we have another case of Sony versus Nintendo versus Microsoft. The PS4 rests in the top five consoles with 115 million units sold. The Xbox One sits at 51 million consoles sold and the Wii U <coughs> flopped and sold 13 million units. <laughs> I mean, I'm laughing right now, but back then as a Nintendo fan, it really wasn't funny trying to convince my friends that my game sounded as cool as Call of Duty, GTA, and all that other shit that was on the real consoles. I mean, it, it really just made me look bad. But not only me, the Wii U flopped so miserably that the Switch couldn't even be classified as a new generation of console. The PS5 and the Xbox Series X was supposed to be made to compete with the Switch, but that just isn't the case. It isn't very relevant to the rest of the video, but if you want to know, the PS5 sold 7.8 million units and the Xbox Series X sold just under 3 million units. Now what do you take from all this? We weren't just comparing sales numbers. The point of me bringing them up, however, lies in the fact that successors to the consoles do worse in general. They might be able to outsell their current competition, but developers are aspiring for overall higher sales. This is especially the case with Nintendo. If we take a look here, the SNES sold 11 million units less than the original NES. The PS3 did well, but sold 68 million units less than the PS2. The Xbox One is sitting 33 million units behind the Xbox 360, and that's including all three iterations of the Xbox One. Wii U sits 88 million units behind the Wii. Finally, the PS5 is currently sitting 107 million units behind the PS4. The Xbox Series X is sitting at 49 million units under the Xbox One. But M Dog, the PS5 and the Xbox Series X have been out for less than a year. A and the scalpers. Yes, okay, you're right. Let me address those issues, all right? First off, the issues with the scalpers. It was reported that the scalpers hold 15% of PS5 stock. So if we give the PS5 another 15% of its sales, then that would make the PS5 in the 9.2 million range within half a year, which is pretty good, but that number is being nice. Furthermore, and more to the point, the jump between the PS4 and PS5 was pathetic at best. The same goes to the Xbox One to the series. The only thing that these had to offer was better graphics, frames per second, and loading speeds. There are a total of 10 PS5 exclusives, and most of which aren't even out yet. So I asked myself, what's the point of buying a PS5? This 
isn't only the case with the PS4 and the PS5. The same goes with the previously mentioned consoles. The SNES was claimed to be a super version of the NES. I mean, it's in the name. It offered new games and whatnot, but primarily served as a better version of the NES, but sold 11 million units less. The PS3 was basically an HD version of the PS2 and sold 68 million units less. The Xbox One to the 360, more storage, slightly better graphics, 33 million units less. Wii U was basically a high definition Wii with a gamepad, 88 million units less. The point is that when a successor to a console doesn't do so much as to innovate, but rather merely serves as an upgrade, it tends to fall short on the sales end of things. I'm sure you're also ready to call me out on the PS2 and the Xbox 360 passing its successors. Okay, the 360 was an HD system which expanded on its Xbox Live feature. This included the Marketplace, Gamerscore, cloud storage, matchmaking, and the party system. It basically shaped online gaming as we know it today. The PS2 basically normalized three-dimensional gaming. Online play was also a thing with a network adapter. The PS4 outsold the PS3 because it took everything the PS3 had to offer aside from backwards compatibility and normalized it. It also held the most exclusive deals within gaming. The ideal console to have is the PlayStation 4. Let's say that the PS4 bought its way to the top, and not in a bad way. Sony made smart business deals and marketing in order to hold a certain amount of power over the Xbox, which is why it's in the top five highest selling consoles of all time. Now going all the way back to the Nintendo Wii, which came out in late 2006, we know that it won the console war of its generation due to its stray from the competition. Instead of having HD capabilities, the Wii innovated with what was probably the best version of motion controls we have seen to date. It didn't focus on high definition resolution in online gaming. Instead, it focused and took advantage of its motion controls and intuitive gameplay. This includes Wii Sports, Wii Fit, Mario Kart Wii, and Wii Sports Resort. For reference, these four games put together sold just as much as Minecraft. You have to remember that these games cost thrice as much as Minecraft and were on a single platform and Minecraft is the best-selling game of all time. However, towards the end of the console's lifespan, it slowly became irrelevant. More and more high-definition displayed televisions were coming out, making the lack of HD on the Wii less excusable. A new line of consoles were also coming out right before the end of the Wii's production. This made the lack of online unappealing, but good thing Nintendo was gonna make a console with all those features. Uh, yeah, but then we, we just get the Wii U. My point in bringing this up is to show the state of the Switch. Is the Nintendo Switch innovative? Yes, just like the Wii. Does the Nintendo Switch have lower graphical capabilities as its competitors? Yes, so did the Wii. Is the online worse on the Switch than its competitors? Yes, so is the Wii. The similarities are there, and we don't want the Switch to fall to the same fate. So how can Nintendo avoid such a fate? Well, Nintendo plans on expanding the units sold on the Switch even more than it did for 2020. RGT85 suggested that they would lower the price of the base Switch and release a newer and improved Switch Pro model. That isn't a bad idea. However, we need to think about what will appeal to the gamers that don't already have a Nintendo Switch. Before I jump onto my own ideas, we'll look at something more logic driven. We all know that in the year of 2020, Animal Crossing is one of the main factors as to why the Switch sales went up. Animal Crossing did wonders in terms of sales, with over 30 million copies within a year on a single platform. I mean, what other game has done that? Admittedly, there was no standalone reason as to why Animal Crossing did so well. Some say that it was a more tranquil game that elicited a sense of peace and lovability. However, there are many more games that can fall in this category that did not do so well. Maybe it was due to the contrast from what was going on in the world. The pandemic claimed the lives of many and affected even more people, myself included. However, there are many other games that pushed weight for the Nintendo Switch. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe sold 10 million copies last year, which isn't as much as Animal Crossing, but can still be suspected as a reason as to why people are getting more Switches. I believe it comes down to actual games that would be good on a hybrid console model. Games like Mario Kart 8 and Animal Crossing are both games that appeal to more than one audience. This is probably why these games sold so well. 
and are the top two most sold games on the Nintendo Switch. I think that new content like a Mario Kart 8 Deluxe update would definitely attract more people to the Nintendo Switch. Being able to market the most sold game on the Nintendo Switch would definitely boost sales figures. A game like Animal Crossing, on the other hand, wouldn't really benefit from this as the game receives updates on a regular basis already. Bundles are also a driving force that push game sales on the Nintendo Switch. The convenience and customization is something that people would want on the Switch. 7 out of the top 10 most sold Switch games also come in a bundle with the Switch. I don't think that's a coincidence. Now for a game like Breath of the Wild, another point arises. People may get that game for the Switch because it's such a good game, but the sequel to the game will relinquish incentive for new players to A, get Breath of the Wild. This is because the sequel is the new main focus, but B, What's the point of getting the sequel if you haven't played the first game? It's not like Grand Theft Auto where you get a loosely connected story and the gap between the two games make you miss out on something if you get the older version. With Breath of the Wild on the other hand, I mean, the game and its sequel is going to be on the same console. I think the solution would be a double game bundle to release with both Breath of the Wilds on a Switch slash Switch Pro. Finally, something that can boost sales is to put successful third-party games on the Switch. At one point, half of the Nintendo Switch consoles had Fortnite downloaded on them. Now, I'm not saying people would get a Nintendo Switch solely to play a free game, but the appeal is there. It's similar to hearing how Minecraft is available on the Switch, and just recently, Apex Legends. I think a game like Grand Theft Auto would make a great addition on the Nintendo Switch or the Switch Pro. This would really prove that Nintendo was trying to encompass all age groups to the Nintendo Switch, not only this, but GTA on the Switch would show players that you can play pretty much any game on this console. This would make up for the worst graphics and frame rate that are holding some gamers from buying a Switch. I think a large game like this, or Call of Duty perhaps, would be great for the Switch Pro. Now for the million dollar question. How can Nintendo avoid its console from becoming irrelevant? I project that at the end of its life cycle, the Switch will be within the top three consoles of all time at least. This will be a difficult thing to overcome, however, with another console. I believe that there should first be a setup. With Mario Kart 8 doing so well, there's no real reason to make Mario Kart 9 yet or release it. However, Mario Kart 9 should be revealed alongside Nintendo's next console and should be released alongside it. Given that Mario Kart 8 was the most sold game on the Switch, Mario Kart 9 would definitely build up the hype for the next console. You can also go ahead and drop Breath of the Wild 3, you know what I'm saying? We won't mind, we won't mind. Or whatever the hell is gonna be at that point. As well as the fourth Splatoon game, you know, uh, I'm, just, I'm just throwing some things out there, along with some new series. Step two is to innovate. Sure, Nintendo will do just that but remember to make it something completely new. I think the hybrid console is a must at this point, but it cannot resemble the Switch at all. Just look at the records. Now, with whatever gimmick this next console is gonna have, you have to loosely tease some big third-party title while using that same gimmick. Player would think, I can play the game like A on the other consoles, but now I can play the game like A and B on this console. Now, we have the launch. People are enjoying the third Breath of the Wild game. Mario Kart 9 is enjoyed by gamers across the world. Splatoon breaks its trilogy and becomes a Halo-like franchise in terms of how the game's release. I think it's appropriate to expect more from this new console. The Wii U did pathetic in sales and Nintendo was forced to make a budget console off of the net earnings they made from the Wii U. However, things are different. The Switch surpassed the competition for the Wii U destroying Xbox One sales by over 50% and is now grasping for the PS4 sales. This console made Nintendo some bread, let's just say that. I think it's appropriate to expect bigger games, better graphics, better frames, and the game should definitely just look better overall. Monster Hunter Rise, for example, wants it to look so good, so bad, but the Nintendo Switch's film grain is ruining that. We still have no problem with all these indie games that keep coming out on the Switch. In fact, keep putting them out there. However, I don't think games should be excluded from being on the Switch due to it not being possible for said game to run on the platform. Why do you think we haven't seen GTA or Call of Duty on the Switch? But this should be a commodity and not something that should be heavily focused on like the other consoles do. Step three is appeal. 
What can Nintendo do to make this new console appealing? Well, the best thing is to make the other consoles obsolete in a sense. Nintendo should aim for a better online subscription service. It's already the cheapest one out there, but why don't we include party chat, messages, achievements that possibly lead to Nintendo gold coins, or custom backgrounds, you know, something fun. Definitely add deals to games in the eShop and virtual console. You know, play all of your favorite past games from the N64 to the Wii U. I mean, Mario Kart All-Stars was available for what? A few weeks and it already hit like 8 million sales? I mean, people definitely want this. There's a demand for this. This would be huge and will create a strong gravity towards players who don't already have a Switch. Don't mention this online service thing during the console reveal, however. This should be in a separate YouTube video a few days later after the console's overview. And because Nintendo's current online system is below subpar, this will be very attractive to new and returning gamers. So we have all the steps laid out, which sounds good on paper. However, it might not all come into fruition. Mario Kart 9 is said to be revealed at E3, which we'll have to wait and see. These are just leaks. At the end of the day, Nintendo has a lot of cards to pull before the end of the Nintendo Switch's life cycle. So we'll see how they'll use them. The thing is, is that I don't want to see history repeat itself. As long as Nintendo is aware of their track record, I feel as though they'd be fine.